focus is on mitotic count and mitotic figure morphology with Dr. Christoph A. Bertram and Dr. Taryn A. Donovan. I'll just take a quick moment to introduce them. Uh, Dr. Bertram is an anatomic pathologist at the University of Veterinary Medicine in Vienna, Austria. The Vet Med Uni Vienna is the only veterinary academic educational and research institution in Austria and is the oldest veterinary university in the German speaking region of Europe. Dr. Bertram graduated from the Department of Veterinary Medicine at Freie Universität Berlin, Berlin, Germany, and stayed in Berlin for his doctoral studies and residency at the Institute of Veterinary Pathology. His current duties as a senior lecturer at the University of Pathology at Vet Med Uni, Vienna, are teaching, directing the biopsy serv service and performing research with a focus on digital pathology and tumor pathology. Our next speaker is Dr. Taryn A. Donovan. Dr. Donovan is an anatomic pathologist at the Animal Medical Center in New York City, one of the largest nonprofit referral hospitals worldwide. She graduated from Cornell University College of Veterinary Medicine and completed an internship at the Animal Medical Center. After a year in general practice, she returned to Cornell for a residency in anatomic pathology and gained additional post postgraduate experience through a fellowship at the Zoological Society of San Diego. Dr. Donovan oversees the necropsy service, directs interactive teaching and educational rounds at AMC, and participates in clinical research collaborations. She's a native of New York and currently lives in Connecticut with her husband, two children, and many pets. Dr. Donovan and Dr. Bertram, uh, thank you. And now over to you. All right, thank you. Let me share the presentation. All right, so you should all see the presentation now. Um, thank you for the kind introduction. So this is a shared presentation from Taryn and me, and I will start with uh, talking about the motility count, and Taryn is going to give all the details relevant about motility figure morphologies. All right, so as Don and Mike have mentioned, we have guidelines, and we um, just want to highlight that this is about uh, the motility count guideline, which you can find on the website, as Mike has shown you just um, earlier. Um, and this guideline was developed by a bunch of people that are listed here. And this is the consensus, basically, that it, that we derived um, using available literature. So generally, um, why do we actually care about mototic activity or mototic count um, in specific? So we, for evaluating tumors, we do want to evaluate tumor proliferation. And we do use that uh, for two steps. So first of all, we use the tumor proliferation for classifying the tumor type. So saying whether this is a benign or malignant tumor, and usually we would uh, evaluate the metotic activity in a more semi-quantitative uh, way by estimating the density. Um, and we also want to derive um, patient outcome or a prognosticate patient outcome, um, especially for malignant tumors. And for this, we definitely need to uh, quantify um, tumor proliferation in a more um, accurate way than just estimating. So there's different ways to um, estimate tumor proliferation or measure tumor proliferation. And one is metotic activity. And this is especially relevant because it can be done easily on uh, standard h &E images. So you can see here the um, cell cycle with h &E, and you can see that metotic figures can be visualized with h &E, whereas all the other parameters would require special stains. So estimating metotic activity is routine for um, evaluating any malignant tumor. There's different method that we can use for quantifying mototic activity. Um, and one of which is of course mototic count and the talk later will be specifically about mototic count. But I would like to highlight the other parameters available. Um, one for all, um, so we, we know the terminology and second of all for, for feature research. So the other methods are 
potential method that we could use for, for future research and improve our um, prognostic abilities of the mitotic activity. So the mitotic count is done routinely, even though it's often called mitotic index, and you will see that the mitotic index is something quite different. So we should use the term uh, mitotic count. For mitotic count, we um, count mitotic figures as realized here by the um, X um, among all the other tumor um, cells within a specific area. And as Don has already detailed um, quite extensively, we would like everyone to count or evaluate 2.37 square millimeters. So the mitotic count for this image would be seven within 2.37 square millimeters. Um, the mitotic activity index is very similar. It also doesn't account for variability of the cell density, um, but you divide by that area. So the mitotic activity index would be per square, per square millimeters. Um, and your number would be divided by the area. So you would have um, approximately three mitotic figures per square millimeter. Um, it's pretty similar, but we are using um, routinely this and the cutoffs are calculated for this. So there's just an opportunity to be later see for, you know, for example, if your tumor size is too small um, or other applications. Um, all right, sorry, so this is, All right, so then there's different um, methods that are actually not used at all in veterinary medicine. Um, they have been used in human medicine and there are some descriptions on the methods, but they haven't been used, unfortunately, but there are potential ways for future research. So I want to um, detail them. A mortality index, as I told you, often the mortality count is actually called mortality index. In previous studies, we should avoid this term because the mortality index is dividing the number of the, the the counts, the mortality count by the number of um, tumor cells within that area. So approximately a mast cell tumor would contain seven to 13,000 cells for a normal dense without edema area. And you would have a percentage or per mil of mortality figures. Um, so that's quite a different number than seven. Um, and it's not commonly done because you have to count the, the tumor cells, which is time consuming and, and a limitation for routine applications. Um, there's another method, it's called volume corrected mitotic index, um, which has been used in human medicine, especially for breast cancer and other tumors that include cystic spaces and other areas where, where you don't expect cells. So you estimate the area um, of tumor within that 2.37 square millimeters, and you divide the number by the proportion that contains tumor cells, and then you have the volume corrected. Um, to, to account for areas that, that you cannot access for the mitotic count. So anyway, so we are going to talk, talk about the method count, but this is done routinely. The others are for future research. So I will break down this talk into the individual steps of the method count, which might be a little bit simple, but I think it's necessary so we can talk about each step in detail. So this is just going to be an example. Um, and we're gonna see later that what I'm showing right now, there will be variability depending on different studies, but generally, uh, when we perform the mortality count, we have to first um, find an area, which I'm going to call um, region of interest, Roy, at low magnification, although we have to consider high magnification for selecting this area. So first of all, we have to find the tumor area. And within that tumor area, we have to find all the mitotic figures within that tumor section, which are displayed here by green dots. And based on this um, mitotic figures, we can estimate a density as displayed by a heat map. And this, of course, is very difficult for, for humans to derive accurately. But it is often the goal to determine an area within a specific uh, density and to select this area. Um, and as Dan was told, this area has a specific uh, size. And then we select this area and go to step, step number two, and we count mortality figures within this step. And this is usually done at high magnification, usually for 400 magnification. So there's multiple sorts of errors and um, this error can arise from methods related variability. And this is what we specifically trying to, to standardize. Um, and there's observer related variability, which is a little bit more difficult to standardize. So both of them can occur in each of those critical steps in error selection and methodic figure um, detection. Uh, and I've told you the, the method related variability at least seems to be easy to standardize. And this is our goal to, to find standard methods that everyone can use. 
um, and any variability should be avoided. Whereas observer-related observer variability, of course, depends on using those methods accurately, but also there's beyond that, there's some variability that it seems to be difficult to standardize. And we're going to see this in a little bit. All right, so step number one, we, um, the goal is to, to find an area within this tumor section that we want to, to use for counting orthotic figures. So this area can be of different location within this tumor sections that we have. And um, this can have a different area size as Don has told us already. And this can have a different shape and we're going to go through each of those steps. So when we look at um, some of the literature that we have in retinal pathology, um, those are all common grading system that are routinely used for evaluating tumors we see that there is quite some variability. Although finding hotspots, this is areas with the highest mototic activity is most commonly done generally. Um, there are other methods that are supposed to have either a region of the periphery or hotspot or select random. Although random is probably not really uh, possible and Don likes to say this is rather haphazard um, selection than a true random selection. And then there's few studies that actually specify um, we'll give more details how this area should look like. Higher cellularity, hotspot, avoid areas of necrosis and ulceration. And even there are some studies that don't give any details how this area was selected. So the question that we have to ask, or we did ask in the group is, which area is the most prognostically relevant? Um, is, this, is it the hotspot? Is it a random area? Is it the average uh, methodic density or is it any other area? And we couldn't find any literature to support our idea. The general, um, dogma is that the hotspot is supposed to be prognostically most relevant, but we don't really have uh, literature to support this. There's very early literature, at least from the key 67 um, index, that the hotspots are more relevant than the, um, the periphery or the, um, the, the, the mean in breast cancer and human breast cancer, but we need more studies for, for veterinary, uh, veterinary medicine, especially for the mortality count. And the next question would be, um, how are metodic figures distributed? And if we want to find the hotspots, can we actually find the hotspots? And how consistent are we to, or is the area that consistently contains that area that we can use as a recommendation? So ideally a tumor, so this is the H&E section, the overview section, you can see a, a hot um, a heat map overlaid on the section. So the greener the area, the more metodic, the higher the metodic count is in this area. And there are certainly some tumors where the density doesn't vary too much uh, so that most areas actually have a high autotic activity. And when pathologists select areas, so this is um, results from a recent study that we did and you can access this um, study already in a pre-published version via this link. And we asked 23 pathologists to, to select areas and they selected different areas, but you know they were all high high autotic areas so that should, probably wouldn't have um, affected the tumor prognostication too much. But then there's also tumors where you have quite variable metodic density. In this case, it is in the periphery or in the invasion front. And in this case, pathologists were quite variable, but most found an area again in the periphery, which had a high density. But unfortunately, there's also tumors that have the highest density in the center and pathologists might have some more difficulties to find this area. And so just that you believe me, um, this is not the one out of a million cases. There's actually many cases that have, um, at least for mustard tumors that have highest density in the center. Um, and again, pathologists had difficulty to select this area. So generally, um, at least for mustard tumors, we don't have an area identified yet that um, might be the most relevant area in, in general terms. Um, and we have analyzed this in a previous study that's, that's published in retinal pathology, where we compare different um, definitions of periphery versus centrum. It's generally thought that the periphery should have highest density, but we couldn't find this for muscle tumors. Um, and we need this, those studies for other tumor types to confirm or to, to analyze whether we find an area that can be, uh, should be used um, generally. Um, and Answering the question whether pathologists can find hotspots, uh, this is another study that we published. Um, you can look up the study with this link, uh, where we asked pathologists to, to find a hotspot area. And those are forest plots. 
where you see the percentage of selections by the pathologist being in the highest 50% motoric density. So pathologists generally were able to find you know, the half of the tumor with a higher, uh, higher motoric density. But they had more difficulties to find the areas with the highest 25%. So here it's almost estimating or just guessing for the pathologist. So they ha we have difficulties to find the, the hotspot, which is not, not surprising at all because it's, it's, you know, you have to consider high magnification while choosing a low magnification area, which just take, um, would take a lot of time to, to evaluate the whole tumor section. Um, so nevertheless, we did generate some general recommendations, um, and this is to avoid certain areas and to focus on certain areas. Um, so you should avoid areas that are generally difficult for you. So any, any areas that contain many autotic figure lookalikes, um, just like the chromosis information, good tissue quality in general. Um, this might not always be possible, but there might be areas that are more ideal for performing a motoric count. And you should try to avoid low cellular areas um, because it's assumed that the motoric density might be lower, but this need, doesn't need to be um, true for all cases. So you, you should avoid, again, necrosis, inflammation, edema, hemorrhage, vascular spaces, uh, ductal spaces, especially relevant for, for breast cancer, for example. Um, and focus on is basically the opposite. And I added that you should focus on the center and the periphery um, as opposed to some other recommendations because we currently don't know where the highest density actually is located. So here's an image, an example of a um, canine breast cancer, just to show everyone knows how, how cystic spaces look like, how dysplasia looks like. But just imagine you have to place a 2.37 square meter area in this, this image, and it might be difficult to find the most appropriate area. So it wouldn't be this area because you have a lot of uh, cystic spaces. It wouldn't be this area because you have a lot of desmoplasia. Here you have a lot of exudate. So, so it's not, if, not easy always to find the area with the highest cell, um, cell density. And this is a muscle tumor, very similar situation, but you have edema. So here would be the highest cellular density, but it doesn't mean that the highest metodic um, activity is here. It, it's generally assumed and you should certainly look in this area, but you should also consider other areas potentially. And here's an example at high magnification. So this is actually the same tumor um, but the tumor has different quality, or the, the tumor section has different quality. So I think all of you will agree that those two metodic figures are true metodic figures, and they are quite easy to identify, and Taryn is going to, to give you all the details relevant to, for detecting those. Um, and this is an image where the 23 pathologists that I've just detailed earlier um, did annotations in, and this actually, sorry, let me show this image. Um, and this is the result. So we, we had um, huge variability between pathologists and most of those were, you know, just annotated by a few pathologists. Some were structures were more, were annotated by more pathology, but generally high variability. And this happens when you have to count in an area with, with poor quality and, and this is just gonna raise your uncertainty. Um, so if you can look for an area where you have higher, higher certainty. So the take home for step 1A would be that certainly the location that you choose will have an effect on your mortality count and in your prognostic abilities. Unfortunately, we don't have an evidence-based practice that we can recommend for you. And we hope that some of you will do um, studies that we can use for our recommendations in the future. And for now, we do recommend that you should use hotspots unless it's stated differently in the prognostic uh, study. All right, let's look at the second step. So this is the tumor size or area size that you're using. And I detailed two different measures of size because they, they are different. And Don has detailed on this a little bit. So either the number of high power fields and Don has explained that high power field is a poor measure of, of size and the actual size in square millimeters. So most studies do give a number of high power fields. Most use 10 high power fields, but there are some studies that use either one or three high power fields. Some give you the magnification that they use for choosing a high power field. It's probably assumed that the others also use for Anadex. And some do give the field diameter um, of that uh, field um, analyzed. Um, few studies actually give the, the millimeter, the area millimeter, and we will see that this, or don't also explain that this will uh, have an effect. 
Um, for those areas that gave the field diameter, you can calculate the area size, so that's fine. Um, but usually it, it, it's very uncommonly um, reported in studies. Right, so um, one high power field at 400x, that's not an error size um, because the field of view that you see with different microscopes in light microscopy will vary. And this depends on the field number. So Don has shown pictures of the, of the ocular with where the number of the field number supported. And the field number correlates to the radius or the diameter of the field of view. And this certainly um, you know, is part of the formula for, for area size. So depending on the field number, your area size will vary quite tremendously. And this can go down. So Patnaik, for example, probably used the field number of 18, just having a small factor of what we're using routinely. And I, for example, have a 26 field number. So I will see much, much more, um, a higher field, uh, field of view. And the same is actually true for, for digital microscopy. So we don't have a round area of view anymore, but we have squared areas based on the monitor that we're viewing at. And mostly the area that we're seeing is smaller than 0.7 square meters, so one high power field. Uh, and this mostly depends on the monitor size and the display resolution and the whole set image viewer as was found out by this study. Um, so mostly they are smaller, but this is actually the, the monitor used by Taryn. And she has a much bigger monitor. That's probably like three times or four times as big as the um, one high power field. So you can see that there's even a much bigger um, variability between, between the field of view. So we definitely need to calculate um, or measure the field of view that you're using with digital microscopy, just like with light microscopy. Um, right, so there was a someone in the chat earlier um, that, that was asking why we're using um, not just like in square millimeters. Uh, and so, so we recommend to actually um, do the matoti count in 2.3 square meters because that's routinely done. But we don't know whether this 2.3 square meters is the most prognostically relevant area. So there is a study done by Bonard and Don did cite this paper um, quite frequently in his talk. And they recommended, for example, to use higher field area size such as five square millimeters because the accuracy or the consistency is higher when you have a higher area um, based on a simulation. And we did a similar thing in a recent publication by Patho um, and we did find that when you do this your matotic count or matotic activity in this, in this case uh, will converge towards the, the medium value and when we assume that the hotspot is actually the most prognostically relevant area reduce or increasing the size will decrease your abilities to, to have a hotspot. Um, so we don't know what's the best ratio um, comparing accuracy for prognosis versus being consistent. And certainly this will also be um, restricted by the time investment that the pathologist can, can invest in counting. Okay, so practical issues. If you have a tumor with an area smaller than the, this 2.37 square millimeters, you need to, to come up with a solution. This could either be, um, you know, count also determine the area that you've been counting and then uh, do the matotic activity index divided by the number or by, by the area size. And then you also have to divide the, um, the prognostic cutoff um, or you can um, do a deeper section and um, continue um, counting um, or you can extrapolate to the full size. So multiply with the factor that you're missing. And all these three methods are considered acceptable by us, but future studies need to show which is the best and whether there's a difference between those. So again, the, the take home for this is that the area size or the, the you know, the, the size of your high power field does certainly have an impact, impact on the mortality count. We currently don't know which area size is the ideal. So we do recommend as a standard to use 2.37 because it is a standard area size of light, micro, light microscopes. All right, so next step would be um, the area shape. And again, many studies do not report in which area shape the high power field should be arranged. Um, some do say they need to be continuous, contiguous. Um, others say that they don't need, to, they shouldn't be contiguous. Um, right, so contiguous means that the high power fields should be arranged next to each other, we are non-contiguous, and this probably goes along with random area selection. 
um, they are not connected to each other. And, and in contrast, they probably it probably should be located all over the tumor section. And the the studies on Canaan osseous sarcoma actually say that they should include both regions of the periphery and both and of the center. Again, with light, micro light microscopy, we do not have round field of views, so we can have, or we potentially should have the squared field of views, but this can be any shape with light microscopy. But ideally, that's that's our two cents, uh, because the monitor has a shape um, of, a, of a rectangle, you probably, um, it would be most convenient to have a rectangular shape. And you, you don't need to be in a certain arrangement, uh, they, they just need to be connected. So you can avoid certain areas, such as like, such like necrosis or um, cystic ducts. Um, so you don't have non-tumor non cells in your areas that you elevate. And again, there might be some tumors. So biology isn't always 100% easy. Uh, so there might be some tumors, in this case, a trans transitional cell tumor of the um, canine kidney, where you have difficulties to find such areas. And so this area would probably only include 50% of tumor cells um, if you do a squared area. And with light microscopy, you have the potential to do it much more accurately. And this should also be some um, focus of some research, future research. So again, the take home is that certainly the shape will affect our mortality count. We don't have literature to support which is the best. And for now, we do recommend to use contiguous areas. Right, so step number two would be to count all mortality uh, figures, and those include typical and atypical mortality figures. And Taryn is going to give you all the details how they look like and how we can um, detect them. Um, so I will skip this part um, and leave it to Taryn. So, but again, just want to um, give you some information about the variability that pathologists have in this process. So when pathologists look at the same area, and this is again some data of the recent study that we did when pathologists evaluated the same 2.37 square meter area. Um, and we had a ground truth based on uh, immunistic chemistry that also Tarin is going to show you and, and tell you something about. Um, we found out that pathologists only find a, well, a certain percentage of mitotic figures that are truly present. So we do tend to overlook quite a big number of mitotic figures. And our study was about 40%. And we also tend to. Um, to find some mitotic figures that actually did not seem to be mitotic figures. Um, overall, there was also variability between pathologists with a coefficient of variability of 50%. So we do um, have quite some, some difference when we perform the mitotic count, even in the same area. So it's not only the error selection, it's also that we have variability in detecting um, mitotic figures. And so this variability, um, also has is, is different between pathologists. So those are different. Some some statistic terms that probably most are not familiar with, and I will also talk about those terms in the fee pass section of this webinar. But recall it, it's the same like uh, sensitivity, and precision is um, how many mitotic figures were count. How, how many of the counted mitotic figures are true mitotic figures? Whereas recall is how many of the true mitotic figures were counted. And those dots represent individual pathologists. So when you compare this, you can see that one pathologist had a very high sensitivity, but rather low precision, whereas other pathologists had a very high precision and a rather low recall. So we tend to have different cutoffs or different um, trade-offs between precision and recall as pathologists. And this will certainly influence um, whether we count this mitotic figure or whether we don't count this mitotic figure. And also this will affect the mitotic count, obviously. All right, so when we combine step one and two, we obviously have the mitotic count. Um, and there's also some information from previous public um, grading systems um, or some, some instructions what to do once we have the mitotic count. And so the lymphoma study said that we should repeat the mitotic count for uniformity. And then there's a soft tissue sarcoma grading system that says that we should recount when we are close to the cutoff value. So we also um, thought about these two aspects. And to be honest, we weren't really sure what's meant with repeat for uniformity, especially in the context where you have to find hotspots. We weren't really sure what's meant with uniformity. So if someone from the audience has some information what's meant by this, we, we're happy to, to, to give it a thought. Um, 
So this potentially meant to increase consistency or reproducibility, but this would conflict with um, hotspots. So we recommend if you repeat your matodic count, we report, recommend to report all the matodic counts that you reported, so all the individual counts, and especially also report the highest uh, matodic count. Um, and then regarding the when you're close to the cutoff, um, so We do actually recommend to repeat the matodic count when you're close to cutoff, and this means potentially repeat it in the same area and certainly in different areas of your tumor section. We currently don't really know whether this is going to have a bias on on your prognostication abilities because when you perform studies, uh, they don't know the cutoff when they did the matodic count; they just determine it afterwards. So we are currently not aware how much this will influence the the prognostic abilities. But you now, as we are having a two-tiered system for, for prognostication, we are very anxious that we miss a potentially malignant tumor. So we agreed that this might be for now a good way to, to ensure that we are detecting all malignant tumors. Um, right, so this is also from this study, um, and this is the 23 pathologist, and we asked them to do the matodic count. Um, and so the, the purple, color is when they have to look for the region and they have to detect the matodic figures, whereas in the stage two is um, they, they had the same tumor area, so they only had to detect the matodic figures. And you can see both aspects have some, some variability and cause them some variability, and especially around the cutoff, there's huge variability in this case. So many pathologists, especially when they have to select the area and count the matodic figures, many were below, but many were above. So we certainly do have some variability. Um, giving this two-tier system with a buffer cutoff and below a cutoff. So there's a huge discussion, uh, what was a huge discussion within our group about cutoffs, and we, we certainly need future studies to, um, to look at this. Generally, when you have low cutoffs, um, you will have a more sensitive prognostication, whereas a lower specific prognostication when you're as compared to high cutoffs, we have a you know lower sensitivity and higher specificity, and we certainly will need to to work on guidelines um, together with um, oncologists, which is the best trade-off that we want for our patients. Um, and this would be a you know a truly controlled environment where you have all the methods standardized. In reality, um, this is a little bit different actually. So we have. So this is the studies or comparing the studies for canine cutaneous mast cell tumors. And there's two published um, cutoffs for the matodic count used as a solitary parameter. It's either below two or above two and below five and above five. And there's different studies that report sensitivity and specificity. And you can see that the, those two parameters vary a little bit between um, those studies. And this is this is, this is what we expect because we don't have, or they didn't use standard methods. They had different pathologists that have different um, precision recall trade-offs. Um, they definitely use some different study populations. They potentially use different um, methods for outcome assessment. And all this variability will affect um, the mortality count. So this is basically the, um, the, the, the information that we need that or the, the that we, we need not only to need to standardize in the multi count methods, so we need to standardize 2.37 and so forth, but we also need to count, um, need to standardize all the other methods um, used for, for studies, that is prognostic outcome assessments, um, study population, pathologists, and all that. So we need to do a lot more than just standardizing multi counts. So the overall take home from my part is that we need. Um, you know, for the different steps that we first of all need to find hotspot locations for the standard mortality count, we, need, we should use the standard area that we propose to be 2.37 square millimeters. Um, those individual fields of view should be selected contiguous, and we need to count all mortality figures in this. Um, but we hope that there's going to be future research and we can modify our recommendations based on the best practice. Okay, so I just have one more slide and this is Don's favorite. So Don likes to think a lot about future considerations. This is great because we need to improve our mortality count as I just mentioned basically on, on each of each slide that I presented. 
And we do have a quite long list on our website and our guideline, what we think should be standardized or should be researched in future studies. Um, and just to sum it up a little bit, um, we need to repeat studies. We need to reconfirm the prognostic value of multi counts for each tumor type. We need to investigate new methods um, and compare the new methods with old methods. We need to compare to outcome and find appropriate cutoffs. And we need to um, combine mortality counts with other prognostic parameters because non prognostic parameter as, a, as on itself will be ideal. And we hope that those research will be done in the future and we can change our recommendations based on, on, on you know, best practice. All right, thank you very much. Right, I will share my screen. Hold on a sec. Okay, uh, thanks, Christoph, and thanks everyone for uh, for listening. Um, so I'm just gonna go right into uh, mitotic figure morphology. Um, this slide is an image of the guideline that you can find at the website, which is on the upper right hand corner here. Um, and here listed are all of the authors that wrote this guideline and just, you know, kind of, as everyone's been saying today, this is a group effort and we really appreciate your involvement, your comments, and look forward to your contributions. So these are five important take home points that I want to impart um, by giving this talk today. And as we go through the features of mitotic figure morphology, hopefully these points will be helpful to you in your daily diagnostic workflow. Um, I'm not going to read each one of these to you. We'll visit these throughout the talk and we'll uh, look at this list again when we get to the end of the talk. So the mitotic figure is something that we're all so familiar with. Um, it's something that we evaluate in every single tumor that we look at. It's one of the oldest and most widely used methods to estimate cell proliferation in tumors. It's quick, it requires no additional equipment um, or cost. And we use counting mitotic figures to generate the mitotic count, either alone or as part of a grading scheme to aid in clinical decisions about prognosis and treatment. So if we wanna standardize, we wanna help standardize the mitotic count, you know, all the steps that Christoph mentioned, we need to also standardize um, the way that we define mitotic figures um, and sort of have a clear understanding of what we're talking about when we, when we discuss this. So most veterinary papers don't actually give methods for how they interpret mitotic figures. Um, if you look in any veterinary paper and you look in the method section, they don't really say, this is how we classified mitotic figures. They just say we counted mitotic figures. A lot of the human literature uses this Van Deest reference. So they'll say, you know, we identified mitotic figures according to the criteria proposed by Van Deest et al. And the Van Deest paper is from um, Human Pathology. It's a 1992 paper. And the criteria are listed here. I wish I had a better copy, but this, is, this was the best I could get. So they're listed here on the right. So you can see that some of these criteria include an absent nuclear membrane. So the cells have passed prophase. You should be able to see um, clear so-called hairy extensions um, of nuclear material, which is really a great uh, descriptive terminology and is a helpful feature for me, at least when I'm trying to decide if a structure I'm looking at is a mitotic figure or not. Um, these, uh, the chromosomal material is usually in an aggregated clot, which is either going to be linear or separated uh, within the cell. And then I just want to draw your attention to this bottom part, um, because this is, Don mentioned this, and this is something that we don't do anymore, but um, this was based on speculation um, that future automated systems would count a telophase mitotic figure as two separate mitoses. But we now know uh, that automated image analysis can be trained to recognize a telophase mitotic figure as one. So that's no longer necessary. Despite having these Van Dees criteria, uh, we know in the literature that, and you know, Christoph talked about this already. So I'm just gonna briefly say that disagreements in labeling structures as mitotic figures occurred uh, with you know, variable frequencies. You can see in some of these papers, three of which are human, one of which is veterinary. The ranges are pretty, uh, pretty wide from 6% to 68%, which is pretty, pretty incredible if you think about it. 
Um, so mitosis is nuclear division or karyokinesis, and it occurs during the M phase of the cell cycle. So in this diagram here, that yellow portion is just one portion of the cell cycle. Um, when we look at a mitotic figure, um, mitosis is the process of karyokinesis, whereas the mitotic figures are the structures that we can um, view with microscopy. Um, and so just to differentiate between those, um, those words. It's important to remember that mitosis is a continuum. So uh, the cells that we see in tumor specimens may be within one of these five phases or they may be between the phases. So this diagram is just approximating the five phases of mitosis um, that are recognizable in histologic specimens. And just you know, to give a little reminder of uh, those of you who have probably not thought about mitotic figures since high school biology. Um, so I'll briefly go through uh, the five phases and morphologic features of, the, of each of these. So for each phase, I'm going to have a diagram on the left and a microscopic image on the right. So the first phase uh, is prophase, and this is where um, you get dissolution of the nuclear membrane. So in the diagram, the nuclear membrane is represented by these dissociated pink lines. Um, and more importantly, you start to get um, you start to get the chromosomal material becoming more compacted um, and sort of moving to the center of the cell. So um, the other thing that you that occurs during prophase, but that you don't see microscopically, would be that the spindle apparatus is starting to um, to, to be present, but it's not something that we can recognize microscopically. So you'll notice that on the lower left, I have a cytology image to show you prophase. And why is that? The reason is you cannot really identify prophase in a histologic section. And we really tried. We tried to get a consensus between us at VCGP. We looked at hundreds of images, um, and we just could not come to a consensus uh, for, you know, among our group as to what would constitute a prophase mitotic figure uh, with histopathology. And so the general um, feeling is that we really cannot differentiate a prophase mitotic figure or a cell that's undergoing mitosis that's in this phase of mitosis from a mitotic-like figure, which is something that looks like a mitotic figure but is not. So because of the fact that um, the nuclear material has no protruding rods and spikes. So we kind of had this loosely compacted nuclear material in the center of the cell in the cytology image, um, and it's preserving the nuclear shape as being round. We really, really can't differentiate that from a mitotic-like figure. So the recommendation is to not count prophase as part of your mitotic count. The next phase would be prometaphase, and that's sort of the earliest phase that we can recognize. Um, that is, um, basically where we get further compaction of the nuclear material. Again, we get the spindle apparatus is starting to form, but it's not something we can really appreciate in microscopic sections. Um, and so the chromosomes are forming a dense cluster in the center of the cell. But the key of prometaphase is that we can see spikes and projections. So just like this, this uh, image on the lower right is showing, we have projecting spikes coming from that chromosome cluster. And that's really the key feature and the way that we can differentiate um, this mitotic figure from a mitotic-like figure. Um, the biggest overlap, though, because we tend to have a central aggregate um, between a, you know, a prophase mitotic figure would be a mitotic-like figure. So that would sort of be our differential. And then at the end of prophase, you, you can get a rosette formation. So you can actually see a ring formation uh, in prometaphase as well. The next phase would be metaphase, and that's when the, comp the compacted and duplicated chromosome material is um, forming a linear band or plate in the center of the cell. Um, and so basically these chromosomes are getting ready to be separated into what will become the daughter cells, right? So we get this dark um, band across the center of the cell, um, and these uh, chromosomes are going to move along the spindle apparatus as they, as they separate. So one of the things uh, to keep in mind is that, you know, we're looking at a three-dimensional structure in two dimensions. So the linear band of chromosomes is going to look different depending on the orientation of the cell. Um, so if the, um, the plate of chromosomes is perpendicular to the spindle, we're going to see a band or a linear plate. If it's parallel to the spindle, like in this uh, diagram here on the right, we're going to see a ring shape. So metaphase can either be a band shape or a ring shape, and both of those are considered normal um, mitotic figures. So this would all be considered a normal structure. Um, and then this, you know, this is my favorite mitotic figure by far, I think, and it's just got beautiful rods and spikes, and it's just showing the irregularity at the periphery, which again is a really helpful way to identify mitotic figures. 
So in, during anaphase, um, this is when um, the plate uh, or ring from metaphase is going to separate into two clusters. So each cluster separates and is being pulled apart along the microtubules of the spindle. Um, and you're going to see variable distances of these clusters when you're looking at the, the histopath. So on the lower right hand image, we can see the two clusters are really close together and on the uh, sorry, the lower left and on the lower right, we can see that these clusters are further apart. So this is, again, a very easily recognizable phase of mitosis. I think it's one where we um, tend to get, you know, less interpathologist variation. Um, it's not as important to see the spikes and projections because, you know, we have those two clusters being separated is very recognizable. There is a little bit of overlap with telophase, but again, these are all part of the continuum. The last phase is telophase, um, and that's when the two chromosome clusters have moved to the opposite ends of the cell, and you have formation of a cleavage furrow. Um, and that's the indentation that will denote the separation of the daughter cells once they separate. Uh, again, you know, in the diagram, we're showing the nuclear membrane, but this is not something we can really appreciate um, in our sections. And then when we look at telophase, again, we're going to see two clusters being pulled apart, but they should be the cells should still be connected because the cells haven't undergone cytokinesis. We're still just looking at karyokinesis. So on the lower left-hand image here, we see a really obvious connection uh, between these two cells. So we can look at this and we could easily uh, deduce that this is one mitotic figure. The figure on the right, though, we, we see the, you know, the membrane delineation, and it looks like these are two separated cells. So how would we know that it's a telophase versus just two cells that are undergoing mitosis at the same time. Um, so our recommendation for this, um, because, you know, again, we're looking at three-dimensional structures in two dimensions, and they might be connected in a plane not visible to the pathologist, we recommend that you use the cell width. So you look at the distance between the cells. So if you're looking at this cell versus this cell, they're really close to each other, and they're less than one cell width apart. Um, and so if you use that as a guideline, a general guideline to make a decision about whether a mitotic figure is one or two when it's in telophase, um, that should be a helpful way to, to go about it. This upper right image is showing three mitotic figures that are close together in a tumor. These are all prometaphase mitotic figures, but they're all, you know, we, none of us would count these as, as, you know, as this wouldn't be one. These are one, two, three separate mitotic figures because these cells are really far apart from each other, even though they're all relatively close together. So the take home messages for, you know, normal mitotic figures would be look for spikes. Like, again, I can't really um, say enough how important the spikes are. They're really helpful um, in, in differentiating a mitotic figure from a mitotic like figure. We don't count prophase because we really can't recognize it. We can't differentiate it from a mitotic like figure. So we would recommend counting prometaphase right now at this point anyway, prometaphase to telophase. And when you do see a telophase mitotic figure, that's considered one. If you are not sure, use the cell distance um, as a guideline if you don't see a connection between the cells. Um, and you know, if we want to mitigate interpathologist variation as much as possible, we really should be counting only definitive mitotic figures for our mitotic count. So um, errors during cell division can cause genetic abnormalities that we can sometimes observe morphologically. And when we see those, those are atypical mitotic figures. Um, so in human medicine, they've actually um, correlated atypical mitotic figures with uh, poor prognosis and outcome in some human tumors, that's really not been looked at in veterinary medicine. So that is something that we certainly could use some work on. Um, but there's two general broad categories of atypical mitotic figures, and that's um, this slide is showing abnormalities of symmetry. So um, on the left-hand side here, we're looking at a tripolar um, mitotic figure, both on cytology and histology. Um, we could also call these multipolar. It's basically when there's more than two spindle poles within one cell. And so what you get is more than two chromosome clusters and uh, the chromosomes are gonna be moving in more than three directions um, at anaphase. So that, you know, this is a very common atypical mitotic figure. It's relatively easy to recognize. Um, and I would say this is sort of like the, the flagship atypical mitotic figure because it is so easy to recognize, and I think the others are a little bit, um, a little bit tougher. So the other 
um, atypical mitotic figure, which is an abnormality of symmetry, is this asymmetric bipolar mitotic figure, which is being shown here on the bottom left. Um, and that's basically when the two chromosome clusters are of unequal sizes. Um, and it's much easier to see this in, during anaphase and telophase. Um, so here in the cytology image, we can see, you know, just a an uh, uh, asymmetric view of the two clusters, the same on the histology, but you know, sectioning artifacts could definitely create that kind of appearance. So we have to be careful about over, um, over interpreting that. The next um, broad category of atypical mitotic figures would be segregation errors. Um, so these are in, in, uh, comprising chromosome bridging and chromosome lagging. So chromosome bridging is when we have um, uh, chromosomes that are basically touching from one pole to the other. So they're sort of stretching across the two poles. Um, and then chromosome lagging is when we have chromosomes that are not in contact with the larger aggregates that were sort of left behind during anaphase or telophase. So again, these structures are probably much easier to visualize and characterize on cytology. It's just a lot easier to see. Um, we're looking at an entire cell. We're looking at a you know, 100x magnification, whereas, you know, we're mostly looking at 400 um, on histopathology. So it might be a little bit harder to be definitive about what exactly we're looking at when we're um, interpreting a typical mitotic figure. So we just have to be uh, careful, you know, about not being too specific when we can't be um, in identifying these, these atypical figures. The, um, one of the biggest problems I think that pathologists have are differentiating mitotic-like figures from mitotic figures. So we're going to talk a little bit about mitotic-like figures. Um, you know, what are they? Um, these are structures that appear similar to a mitotic figure, and they would include um, apoptotic bodies, hyperchromatic or deformed nuclei, um, karyorectic nuclei, inflammatory cells, or tissue artifacts. Um, and basically, these are going to be characterized by hyperchromatic structures. Usually, they're very dark. Um, one or more, you can have multiple within the cell. Um, usually they have smooth surfaces. So again, this is a key. The smooth surface can help you differentiate. Um, and then the, the last two on the bottom here, you may or may not have these to help you along. So an eosinophilic cytoplasm sort of guides you more towards a mitotic-like figure. Um, and then the presence of a nuclear membrane also helps because you shouldn't be seeing that in a mitotic figure. Um, some of you might've picked up on the fact that we do have a mitotic figure in this image. so. This is a nice little spiky guy here this is a pro-metaphase mitotic figure. So the take home, uh, the three best features for differentiating mitotic figures versus mitotic like figures are context, contour, and color. Okay, so if you're looking at an area like this lower left panel here, where you have poor cell preservation, you have a lot of pycnotic nuclear debris, um, that, you know, you'd probably be more likely to go with a mitotic like figure than a mitotic figure. Um, if you are looking at a structure and it has a smooth contour versus a spiky contour, that's more likely a mitotic-like figure. And then things that have an eosinophilic cytoplasm um, are more likely to be a mitotic-like figure versus a mitotic figure, which we'd expect more to have an amphiphilic to basophilic cytoplasm. Um, and that's basically because, you know, uh, eosinophilic cytoplasm suggests uh, denaturation of cytoplasmic proteins and loss of mRNA, whereas um, amphiphilia or basophilia would be expected with increased amounts of mRNA on ribosomes of neoplastic cells or young cells. Is whole slide imaging okay for counting mitotic figures? So the upper uh, images here on the upper screen were all taken with whole slide images. The images in the lower screen were taken with light microscopy at a high magnification and then cropped. I think you can see that you can make out the spikes very nicely in both images. Uh, so, you know, using uh, whole slide imaging is, you know, somewhat of a, a lot of us are using this regardless, um, but it, it does seem to be okay in terms of identifying mitotic figures. There is pretty good agreement um, in general between whole slide imaging and um, light microscopy in terms of um, diagnosis and mitotic count. Um, not many validation studies have been done in veterinary medicine. Um, you know, the, the concern would be that, you know, you don't have an ability to find focus with whole slide images. Um, and there have been some variable results when comparing object detection um, with light microscopy versus whole slide images. Um, you know, likely we have a 
bit of a learning curve with some some of this new technology. Um, but the bottom line is that you know structures that we have a hard time identifying with light microscopy probably we're also going to have a hard time identifying them with whole slide imaging. Um, so I'm going to move on to the quiz, and um, this is this this is the question that came with the quiz. I'm not going to repeat the question, but basically I showed you an image and I asked you to, to decide whether you would include that in, in your mitotic count. Before I get to the quiz, I want to discuss PHH3, which is um, something that Christoph mentioned earlier. Uh, and the reason, I, the reason we use this is because we wanted, we thought you guys might want to have a ground truth for, for these quiz questions. Um, it'd be a little bit more believable to say yes or no, because otherwise it's just somebody's opinion. Um, so a phosphorylated um, histone three is an, an immunohistochemical marker that's used to identify mitotic figures um, because phosphorylation of histone three occurs almost exclusively during mitosis. So we can use that phosphorylated histone um, as a marker and make that specific for mitotic figures. So what we did with these questions, and I didn't do it, um, this is Dr. Bertram and Dr. Klopp Fleisch's lab that did this, um, but they basically, they de-stain the H&E slides and then they re-stain them with the PHH3. So the structures we're looking at on the H&E versus the PHH3 are the exact same structures. Um, that said, when you interpret PHH3, a true positive would be a, a positive staining intensity combined with a morphologically unambiguous mitotic figure. Therefore, the morphology is still important when you're interpreting this immunohistochemical stain. Okay, so I'm gonna go through the quiz questions. Um, this is the first one. And I must, I will just say that we got such a great response. This was awesome. Um, we had about 400 responses and then Dr. Williams uh, sent out that email um, and Dr. Kohler sent out the email, the, the two. So I think we got a lot more responses. We got about 300 more after those went out. So I had to stop. Uh, I had to stop at around 700. We got another 100 or so after I did that. Um, but so, so, so looking at this structure, you know, what are the features? It, it is spiky. It's got some irregularity on the bottom here. It's hyperchromatic and linear. It is a little blurry. Um, and then the cytoplasm is somewhat, somewhat pale. So I put this one on here because I, I, this is a, I should have mentioned, these are all canine cutaneous mast cell tumors. And um, I see this shape in the mitotic figure sometimes. And to me, this looks like the Batman sign. <laughs> so I don't know if any of you also thought that, but I have definitely seen this shape before and I really think it exists in, in mast cell tumors at least. I don't know about other tumors, um, but maybe it's, I just watched too much Adam West when I was a kid, so I don't know. Um, so you'll see on the PHH3 here that we have a nice positive staining. So this yes is a mitotic figure. Um, about three quarters of you answered yes as well. Um, and so, you know, good job on that one. There is a positive one up here. Um, and if you go back, it's just too blurry. There's no way you could have um, seen that uh, on this one. The second one is this a mitotic figure. This one, um, there was a little bit, it was a little bit more difficult uh, for the crowd on this one. Um, but this one, you know, has some similar features. It's linear, right? It's a band, it's spiky, um, and it has some chromosomal structures that are not attached to the band. So this looks like lagging chromosomes. Um, let's see if it stains, it stains very nicely. So this is, yes, a mitotic figure, but it's an atypical mitotic figure, but it still would go towards your mitotic count. So we can see here um, in the chart that, you know, this one had a little bit less consensus and a little bit more uncertainty, probably because of those um, uh, areas of, of the chromosomes that were not attached to the band. Um, and then we, we have another cell staining positively down here. And that one is, you know, also band-like, um, very hyperchromatic and, and has some spikiness and irregularity to it. Number three um, at the bottom of the screen here, um, this structure, you know, is a little hard to make out. It's got multiple little hyperchromatic areas. It's vacuolated. The cytoplasm is somewhat eosinophilic compared to some of the cells around it. Um, so, you know, it's just, you know, this has got multiple hyperchromatic structures that have a, a pretty smooth outline. Um, and so for this reason, this is not a mitotic figure, this is a mitotic-like figure, and it does not stain with the PHH3. If we go back, we had another nice um, pycnotic nucleus right there that also didn't stain, um, and the vast majority of you agreed with that. 
Number four, this one is really interesting to me. So this one, um, what are the features here? This one is pretty blurry um, and we don't really see the spikes well. And we, we can see it's a little irregular, but the fact that we have two chromosome clusters being separated makes this you know, late anaphase, early telophase, right? Um, and the spikes are a lot less prominent, but we have the two aggregates. So this one got so much consensus. Um, you know, basically everybody said this is a mitotic figure, which I thought was so interesting that, you know, this anaphase structure, you know, everyone agrees that this is a mitotic figure. Um, so yes, it is a mitotic figure, but why is it not staining with PHH3? One thing I forgot to mention is that PHH3, um, you lose phosphorylation of histone in telophase. So the telophase um, and maybe late anaphase doesn't stain or stains variably with PHH3. So again, that's why with this stain, you really do have to use the morphology to help you um, to interpret it. So even though it's not staining, I do interpret this as a, as a mitotic figure. Number five, um, the arrow pointing here at this structure. We have, you know, hyperchromatic in the center, very irregular, you know, spiky um, with a pale cytoplasm. So this one, yes is a mitotic figure and the vast majority um, uh, thought so. If you go back, you see this, there's a nice telophase here. Again, these are separated. We can't see the junction, but if you use that one cell width uh, apart, you would count this as one structure. And this is also not staining the PHH3, which makes sense because it's a telophase. Number six, we have this ring-shaped hyperchromatic structure. The key feature for this one is that it's pretty smooth. Um, you can't really use eosinophilic cytoplasm because the whole slide is eosinophilic. So really it's the smooth contour that's helpful here. Uh, and if we look at the PHH3, we have a negative um, and, and most people agreed with that. We also have a very similar structure up here, which is also not staining with PHH3. So that's a mitotic-like figure. Next one, um, also a little blurry, but kind of the same thing, ring shaped and smooth no spikes. Um, it kind of just looks like a, a nucleus, like there's a nuclear membrane there. This it looks similar to the cell right next to it. And these are both, this is negative. We might have a little background staining of this cell, but again, we, sorry about that. We um, have, you know, most of the crowd um, picked that this was a mitotic-like figure. So that's great. This one, a little less consensus. Uh, this is another ring shape, but it's spiky. So we have a ring shape, we have rods and spikes, and we have a pale cytoplasm. So this is consistent with a ring metaphase, which is a normal mitotic figure. You can see we had a little bit less, a little bit more uncertainty and nose on this one, um, but this is, you know, a, a, a good ring metaphase normal mitotic figure. Number nine, uh, this one I think is uh, had a lot of consensus because it's very spiky, so hyperchromatic and spiky. The cytoplasm looks the same as all the cells around it, um, and very many people picked that this is, you know, could we have some chromosome lagging here potentially, but it doesn't matter if this is AMF or not. Um, we, we don't really know if that's significant, and so this would be counted for the, toward the mitotic count. This one, is this a mitotic figure? Um, we're, we have three to go. So this one, hopefully you can appreciate this kind of this Y shape and this, these three linear structures that are in the nucleus here. Um, and so this, um, you know, we do see some irregularity, but I think what obscures this structure is the chromosome material kind of between the three lines. Um, so this is kind of like a combination atypical mitotic figure. This is a tripolar mitotic figure with some chromosome lagging. Um, and, uh, but, but it's the, it's the, the three, um, the three linear, structures that, that tells you that this is um, an atypical, a, a atypical multipolar, atypical mitotic figure. Okay, and so this one had a little bit more uncertainty and nose in this one. We also have a ring metaphase up here, but I'm gonna keep moving. This one, is this a mitotic figure? So this one has multiple hyperchromatic round structures with very smooth borders. Um, and, you know, can't really use the eosinophilic cytoplasm because the whole slide is eosinophilic, um, but this is a, a classic mitotic-like figure because it's got that, you know, very smooth contours and the vast majority picked that this is a mitotic-like figure, which is, which is fantastic. And then the last one is the hardest one. Um, this structure, what can we say about it? You know, it's, 
looks like chromosome material. It's separated. It's not really in any structure that we associate with a uh, mitotic figure. Maybe it's a ring, but there's also stuff in the center. So it's just a little hard to characterize. Um, you know, does it have rosin spikes? I, I don't know. It's hard to tell. It's a little blurry. So let's see if it stains. It does stain. Um, and this one, it was kind of 50-50, right? So 50% said no, the other 50% said uncertain or yes. And, you know, this probably is a mitotic figure, but we can't call it. We can't include this in the mitotic count because it doesn't have any of the morphologic features that we associate with mitotic figures. So how would we ever be expected to count this on H&E? &E? Um, and so because of this, um, because of the lack of morphologic features of a mitotic figure, we wouldn't count this for the mitotic count. Um, but again, some people might disagree with me or you know, we would likely have some interpathologist variation with that interpretation. So the important points uh, that I wanted to get across, hopefully I did here is we should only be counting definitive mitotic figures. Looking for spikes is a really helpful feature. So what are the, you know, what are the contours of the structures you're trying to look at? Um, and then if you're, if, you're, if you're stuck, use context, contour, and color. Um, don't count prophase if you can even identify it. Um, count prometaphase to telophase for your mitotic count. Telophase would, should be counted as one. And if you're not sure if it's a telophase, use the cell distance between the borders of the cells. Um, so the distance, if it's less than um, one cell width. And then, you know, kind of this is good. This is segueing into the, the future considerations, which is, you know, prognostic significance of atypical mitotic figures um, hasn't been evaluated, but let's, let's look, let's see if there's any significance to those. Um, so for our future considerations, you know, what if we limited the mitotic count to, you know, anaphase and telophase? I mean, I was really struck by how much consensus we had on that anaphase mitotic figure. Um, so, you know, maybe if we restrict uh, mitotic figures to those we can identify easily and agree on, maybe we'll have more correlation with the outcome. Um, again, I already talked about atypical mitotic figures. And then, you know, what about PHH3? Can we, um, does that facilitate our hotspot detection? Um, of course, we would have to compare to H&E because we wouldn't be able to, you know, not everyone has access to PHH3. Um, and then everything that we're talking about here today has to be correlated with outcomes so that we can see, you know, if these prognostic parameters are helpful for the patient. Um, and that's our, that's our main goal is, is really to see if this is gonna help the patient um, that we're trying to treat here uh, to prognosticate. Here are some selected references. Um, I just want to acknowledge the co-authors of this guideline. They're all listed here. This is a big group effort. Um, we all play a role uh, in coming up with, with these um, guidelines and protocols. Um, my brother-in-law, Josh Blaker, is the one that came up with a lot of the diagrams, the mitosis diagram he, he made for me, which is amazing, and also our logo. Um, I want to acknowledge uh, the Davis Thompson Foundation. Thank you so much um, for hosting our website. Um, and also uh, to the Davis Thompson Foundation and the uh, American College of Veterinary Pathologists for sponsoring this seminar. Um, and I, I think we do have to move on to the next lecture, correct? So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna end, end right here. I think we, we need to take a little lunch break now.